Larry Bird was one of the biggest trash talkers in basketball. And a lot of people say, really? You know, they thought it was Reggie or Charles. Bird used to tell me, look here, Mike. You're supposed to be a great defender, right? And I'm going to make sure I tell you where I'm going to shoot the ball at. Yeah, he said, I'm going to get it right here. I'm going to shoot it right in your face. And I'm looking at this guy I'm like, he's nuts. I'm going to go shoot this jump in your face right there in that cone. And it's going to be your Christmas present. I'm going to wrap it up and bust your head open. And that's exactly what he did. <laughs> if he tell you you're going to hit a shot in a certain place, he's going to do just that and there ain't nothing you can do about it. Being a better player each step I took, I was able to look more than the other guys. I had a green light. I could make plays. But I always knew early on, especially when I was a junior and senior in high school, that probably the outcome of the game was going to depend on me. Well, yeah, I interviewed uh, Gary Payton, a venomous trash talker. And I asked him who the most vicious trash talker he's ever encountered. He said Larry Bird. Oh, no question. Bird talk shit shit? Like, what? like, like we talk Let or like... Let me tell y'all something. Bird used to tell me, look here, Mike. I'm gonna go shoot this motherfucker jump in your face right there in that cone. And it's gonna be your Christmas present. I'm gonna wrap it up and bust your head open. All that shit. He told me, young fella, let me tell you something. I can shoot a jumper anywhere I want to. You're supposed to be a great defender, right? I'm going to make sure I tell you where I'm going to shoot the ball at. And I was like, man, come on now. You, you're not going to shoot the ball. <laughs> and so he said, I'm going to take you over in that corner right there. You see it over there by my bench, right? And I'm going to give you something, and it's going to be this jumper. So he went right to that corner, and I'm up on him. I'm under him. And he said, young fella, what did I tell you I was going to do? And he turned around, raised up, and it was all drawn. <laughs> and I said, shit, I ain't going to mess with you no more. He was the coldest dude I ever seen with that shit, man. Everybody be talking about these great greats. They don't be always mentioning him. He was the shit. Yeah. The shit, man. He'll give it to you any way he wanted to. Larry Bird was cold. Bird didn't talk trash to you, Oh, did my he? God. Bird talked yeah. trash to everybody. <laughs> I always tell the story about Larry Bird. I remember him, he was cursing under his breath. And I asked him, I said, Larry, what's going on with you? He says, you guys are being disrespectful to me. And I says, what are you talking about? He says, you guys are putting a white guy on me. <laughs> That's disrespectful. I just started laughing. I had no comeback. He says, he says, it's disrespectful when y'all put a white guy on me. Larry said, I'm insulted that they would put a sorry dude like you on me. He said, no, I don't even want to play no more. He would drop the ball and take a turnover. And I'm looking at this guy like, he's nuts, you know? The story goes that when he played against Denver, they had a guy named John Hansley, a white guy, a really good defender, right? Okay, okay. They put him on Larry, and Larry was weighing his ass out. Absolutely. And Larry would run by the bench and tell Doug Moe, who was the coach, yep. oh, yep. get him off me. That's disrespectful. <laughs> put a black guy on me. Because I, when he I played back in the day, that's all he played against was brothers. That's So hilarious. he was like, yeah, I had to torch his ass so they understand. <laughs> and Larry got on the roll, started so shooting the balls, and every shot was going in. All right, he runs by Frank Layden, who's the funniest guy in, in the league. And Frank is coaching, and Larry says to him, Hey, Frank, don't you have anybody on that bench that can guard me? He goes, so nobody out here can. Frank looked down at the bench and goes, no. <laughs> Along with Steve Jones and Rick Barry, this is Bob Neal. Just moments before the American Airlines Sheraton long distance shootout. The All-Star game is in Dallas, the first three-point contest. And he just starts looking at guys, doesn't say a word, and people are getting kind of nervous. Everybody's sitting there, everybody's real quiet. You knew the guys, but you never were around. Yeah. And nobody's really saying anything, so I walk in and look around. And, and then he finally speaks and says, I'm just, just looking to see who's going to finish second. And says, I hope all you guys in here are thinking about second place because I'm winning this. Excuse me? Did you really say that? Who's playing for second? <laughs> yeah, I did. I was so bad. But... <laughs> yeah, when you walked in there, what were, what, what were you thinking when you made that announcement to the room? Just messing with all those guys? I know going into that, I remember in the locker room, Robert said something that there's no way in the hell I was going to win that three-point contest. So I knew right then I, I had to win. <laughs> that check said my name on it for a week now, and I knew I was going to win this thing. I've been practicing, and my teammates said I wasn't going to win it, but I, I came back and uh, lucked out, really. Bird would luck out again the next year, but in 1988, it looked like his luck had finally run out. He certainly doesn't have that normal Bird rhythm going for him. Come on, man. Seconds remaining, has only seven, has to be 15. That's eight, make it nine, and 10. At 11, as we're counting, 13. A huge rack that time for Bird. He's still got to drop one here quickly, 14. This is a tie for the money. Yo! Larry Bird at the buzzer 
He knew exactly what the score was. He knew that that ball was going to win the competition for him. And it's almost like he did it in dramatic fashion just to make it more fun. He knew it when he let it go and was headed for the winner's circle. He didn't take off his top yet. Oh, yeah. I didn't see when he took off his top. Larry used to come in the locker rooms. He'd be getting his ankles taped and he'd say, you know, hey, ball boy, run in and go find the scoring record in this building. You know, he needed those kind of challenges. He had accomplished every goal. We hadn't lost a game on the trip. And Larry told all of us players and the media, too, Warren I's the last game of the trip. I'm going to play this one left-handed at least at least through three quarters. And it was in a time when, you know, Mikhail was still coming off the bench. And, and so Larry scores his sixth point on a left-handed shot. And I'll never forget him. Mikhail yells out. And Mikhail goes, hey, Jerome, when do we start shooting right-handed? <laughs> and at the end of three quarters, and then he had 27 points left-handed. Well, left-handed is one thing, but when the game got close, I had to go back to the right one. He could hold all these things in his head during the game, so he'd, he'd have a shooting drill at the old Boston Garden. 4.30 in the afternoon, I was an early guy. I'd set up early. The garden would be dark. You know, late in the afternoon by himself, dark garden, come out with an equipment guy and just do the perimeter, shoot for half hour, all you heard was swishing. If he missed a shot during that thing, he'd say that the bull gang set up something wrong with the rim. You know, otherwise that never, that would have gone in. I'd get there early, plug in my Stone Age computer right next to the bench. He'd come over, he'd call me Scoop, he'd say, Scoop, what are you working on? I'd say, I'm doing an early story. Then I'd say, well, I'm doing an early edition newspaper story about your free throw streak. You were approximating the NBA record for consecutive free throws, so don't miss one tonight or I'll look bad in the paper. <laughs> sure enough. First half, he goes to the line for two, and the foul line is lined up right where we're sitting if he looks over. He's at the line, he makes the first. He looks over and winks at me. He looks over and winks at me before he makes the second. <laughs> I mean, guys don't do that today, <laughs> and he would... Always thinking about these things, it's like paying off a bet in the middle of a game. He was doing two things at once. Well, you had the bird night. I had the bird Northern night. Northern yeah, Northern. yeah that, was, that was a tough night, man. <laughs> but did you, nobody was guarding bird, were they? Well, we were trying. You were trying no, to. No, but when, when a guy is literally coming up to court calling his shots, it's in that game, we're on the free throw line, and he's like, he literally says, It's off the glass. Who's next? Where do you want this one from? Uh, and he just made one after another, and, and he just tortured him mentally. Okay, he tortured all of them. I think Bird oh. went by the bench one time, too. He fell in a bench. Oh, yeah, he did. Yeah, he, <laughs> and he called that one. That was the one where he fell in it. He literally said, oh, no. uh, off the glass into the trainer. And, <laughs> no uh, way. Yeah. His last shot, he said, uh, in the trainer's lap, coming down the court. Uh, he shot this high rainbow. Uh, it goes in. Ricky bumps into him and he knocks him on our trainer's lap. So it was exactly what he said. He was Antoine Carr and Cliff Levingston got fined by Fratello, I think. For and, and Eddie Johnson for celebrating. Celebrating Bird. Yeah, it was the best film session. Every time I see, when I see Mike, we still laugh. God, it's it was so the, good. It was the greatest film session ever because at, back then, you know, you watched the real game and just went, you know, with a video. And Mike rewound the celebration 20 times. And they show a shot of our bench. Cliff Livingston and Eddie Johnson are standing up giving each other high five. I mean, everybody was entertained by this. Even That's the guys got, on the Atlanta they bench. They got five for that, I heard. Yeah. Watch this. Watch they the reactions five. on the Atlanta bench. <laughs> <laughs> you see they Scotty Hayes up there them. laughing. Yeah. Watch Cliff Levingston over here. I think yeah, this is Cliff. <laughs> <laughs> and Fratello wouldn't let it go. He just kept rewinding. Oh vroom, vroom, vroom. <laughs> Showing the guys, you remember, they're giving each other high five. And then, and then somebody falls off the bench. Yeah, too. that was when, Eddie Johnson. Yeah. Eddie Johnson falls off the bench in laughter. And Antoine Carr and Cliff gives each other high five. And our film session was 20 <laughs> minutes of that. And, uh, no way. Yeah, and so it was a bad night. The first game against Larry Burke, it was shocking. And I'm a rookie, you know. I go shake his hand, and he put both hands behind his back. And I'm saying, okay, you're getting his head ready to play. First play of the game, he says, I don't know where they got you guarding me, Holmes. And he shoots a three. I was pissed. <laughs> you know, I said, I wasn't mad he hit the three. But did this um, bitch just call me Holmes? <laughs> you know? And so it set up for a really uh, interesting game. Because I remember one time I came down, and I dunked it on him. He laying on the ground. He fouled me, and I'm pointing. And he said, hey, Rook. I said, what? He said, I like you, you you know, he said, you got balls, but I'm still gonna get 30 on your ass, <laughs> you know? <laughs> he got about 38, so he kind of proved his point. But I had to pay my dues. I wasn't upset about that because, you know, back then, you know, as a rookie, you know, you gotta pay your dues, simple as that. 
It was funny, the first time that I played in my rookie year, I guarded Larry Bird, and it took me about 10 minutes to realize I should be probably guarding him instead of staring at him. <laughs> you know? And he came down, I was, it was funny, he came down one time, and Mark West was the center on our team, and Larry looked at me, and then he looked at Mark, and he said, uh, Mark, I'm going to go down, I'm going to come off the screen, I'm going to catch it right there, I'm going to turn around, I'm going to shoot it in the rookie's face, and then I'm going to run down the floor. And that's exactly what he did. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, that just happened. But did he talk to you, or you weren't he good enough? He talked through me. He never, he, never addressed, <laughs> he never addressed me. I love that. Like, I wasn't even there. And did Mark West? Mark West going. Mark was like, all right. Okay, yeah, 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 all right. He probably will. <laughs> hey, good Mark. luck. And then he did. He did it. Well, there he was, did there was nothing I could do about it. He backed up whatever he said. If he tell you you're going to hit a shot to a certain place, or if he's going to take you down to the post, turn around, hit a fadeaway J, he's going to do just that, and there ain't nothing you can do about it. Uh, these guys came in together. In 81, there's Kevin, there's Larry, there's Robert, Dennis Johnson, Danny Ainge, they knew what each other could do. And what I did was said, okay, let's see what's, what's happening out there. And you'd see uh, Larry shooting a three-pointer, and then I'd call a timeout, and they didn't count the three-pointer. Larry just hit what would have been the game when he shot, but KC called timeout. It won't count. It does not count. Boston had called a timeout. Larry came back to the bench and, you know, he was a little upset. So he's very upset with that. So I diagrammed the play. He says, heck with the play, Case. Hey, guys, when I come back after timeout, I'm going to go right to the same spot. And I'm going to kick it in. Give me the ball and tell all the rest of the guys to get out of the way. I said, shut up, Larry. I'm the coach here. Okay. All right. Dennis, you take the ball out, give it to Kevin, then you throw it to Larry, and everybody get the hell out of the way. Celtics are down by two points and Bird is out by the three-point line and he's being guarded by a guy named Johnny Hot. He goes down before the ball is thrown in and he's standing right in front of the Phoenix bench and he looks at all the guys on the bench and says, Yeah, I'm just fixing to bust the three on you guys and just go home. I'm tired of this. <laughs> and he says, uh, watch my hand as I follow through. And, you know, Johnny High sort of, sort of smiles and laughs about it. And I was supposed to cut off the high post and post up for a second and then go across and, and set a pick. Well, I came off the pick and I was wide open and I stood there waiting for the ball. I had a smaller guy to post up and, and Larry just waved me out of the way saying, get out of here, get out of the way. And then he just turns around and shoots a perfect three. As the ball's in the air, he kind of turns towards the Phoenix bench and yells, told you so, and <laughs> running to the locker room. As he continues on to the dressing room, now, that's what you call arrogance. <laughs> and from that time, I learned uh, to run Larry's play, not the coach's play. <laughs> he wanted the light on him. He wanted the focus, and he wanted that ball. And if Casey would ever call somebody else's play, Larry would just say, no, no, no. I'm shooting this ball, and he would. I get a charge when I tell someone on the opposing team that I'm going to hit the last second shot and then do it. That's what it's all about. High game, 13 seconds to play. Celtics basketball. During the timeout, I'm going through a play. And about that time, Larry steps in and says, uh, Coach, uh, why don't you just give me the ball and tell everybody to get out of the way? It's Larry. If he wants the ball, he wants the ball. After the timeout, we walked back on the court, and then Xavier was guarding him. So he tells Xavier, says, I'm getting the ball. I said, I know I'm going to be waiting. And he said, I'm going to get it right here. I'm going to shoot it right in your face. Five, and Bird has the basketball. Look out. Larry Bird, just phenomenal the way that... He came out when we had about that ex exact spot and shot a shot right in my face. And, you know, he was like, I didn't need to leave two seconds on the clock. I walked back to the little sideline like, damn. Larry Bird was one of the biggest trash talkers in basketball. And, and a lot of people say, really? You know, they thought it was Reggie or Charles. Larry Bird talked more trash on the basketball court than, than anybody I've ever played against. So we playing him. The last play, he says uh, to James Worthy, he says, you guys don't have to worry about it. I'm going to go right over there at that corner. <laughs> and I'm going to catch it, and I'm going to shoot it, and I'm going to tie the game or win the game, whatever the case may be. They take the ball out, and I think it was either Danny or, or, or um, DJ? the late, great DJ. Yeah. You DJ coming down, right, with the ball. Oh, great DJ. That's good. <laughs> so pass it to Larry. He's in that corner. Now I got to go out and close Larry Bird out. So as I'm running out to Larry Bird, he's talking trash to me. I don't know why you're running out here. <laughs> Who says that in the middle of the game? He said, I'm gonna wait till you get one step away from me and I'm gonna shoot it right in your face. So I got one step away, he shoots it all net. Three pointer, good. Take the ball out, the man crow right to the corner, caught the shot, <laughs> shot a three. <laughs> <Game> <laughs> it's like, are you effing kidding me?
<laughs> and he turned to me and said, you did all that running for nothing. And he was saying in such a calm way that you didn't think it was trash talking. <laughs> but it's trash talking. You, you're not going to tell me you're going to go over there and shoot the ball in my face. That's trash talking. But he, he would tell you before the play even started. He'd tell you where he's going. He'd tell you when he catches it, there's nothing you can do about it. And it was great trash talking because it wasn't vulgar. I mean, he right. wasn't pounding his chest. You can just be standing next to him. You know, I would jump out and try to block a shot on rotation, and, and he'd say, Scott. You, you jump high, but you don't jump that high. You can't get this. <laughs> so, Scott, you're a little too late. Scott, you're not getting that. Why are you even jumping? Why are you <laughs> running out of it? it? But it don't was do all that. game. He, he say something like, don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, and he talked the whole game, and it was, you know, after the game and after years of thinking about it, you're like, right. man, that dude, why he's one of the greatest players I ever played. He was ridiculous. He came out here. <laughs> Our sportscaster played uh, the Superman theme when he was talking about him that night after the game <laughs> because he did everything. Uh, right. Points, rebounds, assists, uh, just steals, you name it. Larry has such a great mind for the game. I had a lot of respect for him as a competitor. That competitive nature, the work ethic, because I asked a lot of questions. You know, playing with Byron Scott, I asked him a lot of questions. Eddie Jones, Magic, um, James Worthy, Kurt Rambis, all the Laker greats, I would always sit down and just ask them questions. What actually happened there? What did you feel there and why? You know, Bird tough to defend, why? Because he looks slow as shit to me. So he's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, like, I'm missing something. So like, tell me what I'm missing, you know what I mean? You know, like I was saying, uh, growing up in Boston, people all used to always talking about that he can't jump, he can't do this, he can't do that. And you know, a lot of my friends was like that, you know. So, I, you know, I got to the league. I called all my friends back up. I said, you know, all that trash that you were talking, you need to squash all that. This, this man is great. Whatever you were saying for a man who can't jump, he's demolishing everybody. He's doing it on everybody. He's doing it on the best defensive players in the league. Yeah. I never forget driving and I'm listening to a game. It's New Mexico State playing Indiana State. I don't really care about the game, but I... New Mexico State is right up the streets from El Paso, and I went to UTEP, and we're big rivalries, so I'm hoping that Indiana State will beat New Mexico State. And I'm listening to the radio, and I have no clue of the players on either team. All of a sudden, this name keeps coming, Bird. He goes to the right, Bird. He makes the spot, Bird. I said, God damn, who is Bird? Bird. You know, here's Bird and Bird this, and, and Bird, oh, did you see the pass that Bird made? I can't see it, but I'm just trying to imagine it. When the time I got to the end, I said, damn, that brother can play. <laughs> when I got the newspaper the next morning and saw Larry's picture, I said, damn. <laughs> Larry, it wasn't you, you, you know, be honest with you. The young lady that say you were her favorite player, Mine too. I love you too, Magic, but not as much as I like Bird. People always talk about great basketball players, and they don't never mention him to be up in that round. But Larry Bird was cold. Mm -hmm. I don't think nobody ever could get out with him. You ask Magic. That's why Magic had a run, and he was mad when he had to retire in 92 because of what he was going to be missing with Larry Bird. Uh -huh. And then you remember Larry Bird took two more years, and then he quit because he said his main guy who he wanted <laughs> to play against is gone. I'm going to tell this story. We're in L.A., and I'm hurt. I got a poor hamstring, so I'm not playing tonight. So I can't play against the Celtics. You know I'm killing myself. You know, Larry warming up. The anthem is sung and get introduced. And that before they go out on the court, Larry comes down. And he said, you know what? Since you're here, I'm going to put a show on for you. So you just sit back and watch, OK? Don't worry. I'm going to put a show on for you. And I'm like, man, get out of my face, man. Want to hear that? You know, that's Celtics and the Lakers. And he went out. I think he scored 38 points, about 20 rebounds, about 15 assists. And every shot he would shoot, he would turn to me. Every time he hit one, he'd look at me. And I said, boy, you know, the thing about it that I love about you is that most guys talk trash and can't bag it up. But Mr. Bird, you know you can bag your trash talking up. And last but not least, I'm gonna say this because you told me one lie. You only told me one lie in your career. Good. Only one. <laughs> and you only lied to the fans and all the people in the world one time. Do you know what that lie was? You don't remember, do you? 
Larry Bird said that there would be another Larry Bird one day. And Larry, there will never, ever, ever be another Larry Bird. And so, he's mine, and I signed it to you, to uh, the greatest basketball player ever, but more important, a friend forever. I love you, I respect you, and I admire you.